This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Michelle Crandall, Fremont, California, July 2006. Vanity Fair by William Makepeace Thackeray. Chapter 6. Vauxhall. I know that the tune I am piping is a very mild one, although there are some terrific chapters coming presently, and must beg the good-natured reader to remember that we are only discoursing at present about a stockbroker's family in Russell Square, who are taking walks, or luncheon, or dinner, or talking and making love as people do in common life, and without a single passionate and wonderful incident to mark the progress of their loves. The argument stands thus. Osborne, in love with Amelia, has asked an old friend to dinner and to Vauxhall. Joe Sedley is in love with Rebecca. Will he marry her? That is the great subject now in hand. We might have treated this subject in the genteel, or in the romantic, or in the facetious manner. Suppose we had laid the scene in Grosvenor Square, with the very same adventures. Would not some people have listened? Suppose we had shown how Lord Joseph Sedley fell in love, and the Marquis of Osborne became attached to Lady Amelia, with the full consent of the Duke, her noble father. Or, instead of the supremely genteel, suppose we had resorted to the entirely low, and described what was going on in Mr. Sudley's kitchen, how Black Sambo was in love with the cook, as indeed he was, and how he fought a battle with the coachman in her behalf how the knife-boy was caught stealing a cold shoulder of mutton, and Miss Sedley's new femme de chambre refused to go to bed without a wax candle. Such incidents might be made to provoke much delightful laughter, and be supposed to represent scenes of life. Or if, on the contrary, we had taken a fancy for the terrible, and made the lover of the new femme de chambre a professional burglar, who bursts into the house with his band, slaughters Black Sambo at the feet of his master, and carries off Amelia in her night-dress, not to be let loose again till the third volume, we should easily have constructed a tale of thrilling interest, through the fiery chapters of which the reader should hurry, panting. But my readers must hope for no such romance, only a homely story, and must be content with a chapter about Vauxhall, which is so short that it scarcely deserves to be called a chapter at all. And yet it is a chapter, and a very important one, too. Are not there little chapters in everybody's life, that seem to be nothing, and yet affect all the rest of the history? Let us then step into the coach with the Russell Square party, and be off to the gardens. There is barely room between Jos and Miss Sharp, who are on the front seat. Mr. Osborne sitting bodkin opposite, between Captain Dobbin and Amelia. Every soul in the coach agreed that on that night Jos would propose to make Rebecca, Sharp, Mrs. Sedley. The parents at home had acquiesced in the arrangement, though, between ourselves, old Mr. Sedley had a feeling very much akin to contempt for his son. He said he was vain, selfish, lazy, and effeminate. He could not endure his airs as a man of fashion, and laughed heartily at his pompous braggadocio stories. "'I shall leave the fellow half my property,' he said, "'and he will have, besides, plenty of his own. "'But, as I am perfectly sure that if you, and I, and his sister were to die to-morrow, "'he would say, "'Good gad, and eat his dinner just as well as usual. "'I am not going to make myself anxious about him. "'Let him marry whom he likes. "'It's no affair of mine.' "'Amelia, on the other hand, as became a young woman of her prudence and temperament, was quite enthusiastic for the match. Once or twice Jos had been on the point of saying something very important to her, to which she was most willing to lend an ear, but the fat fellow could not be brought to unbosom himself of his great secret, and very much to his sister's disappointment he only rid himself of a large sigh, and turned away. This mystery served to keep Amelia's gentle bosom in a perpetual flutter of excitement. If she did not speak with Rebecca on the tender subject, she compensated herself with long and intimate conversations with Mrs. Blenkinsop, the housekeeper, who dropped some hints to the lady's maid, who may have cursorily mentioned the matter to the cook, who carried the news, I have no doubt, to all the tradesmen, so that Mr. Joseph's marriage was now talked of by a very considerable number of persons in the Russell Square world. 
It was, of course, Mrs. Sedley's opinion that her son would demean himself by a marriage with an artist's daughter. "'But, lor, ma'am,' ejaculated Mrs. Blenkinsop, "'we was only grocers when we married Mr. S., who was a stockbroker's clerk, and we hadn't five hundred pounds among us, and we're rich enough now.' And Amelia was entirely of this opinion, to which, gradually, the good-natured Mrs. Sedley was brought. Mr. Sedley was neutral. "'Let Jos marry whom he likes,' he said. "'It's no affair of mine. This girl has no fortune. No more had Mrs. Sedley. She seems good-humoured and clever, and will keep him in order, perhaps. Better she, my dear, than a black Mrs. Sedley, and a dozen of mahogany grandchildren.' So that everything seemed to smile upon Rebecca's fortunes. She took Jos's arm, as a matter of course, on going to dinner. She had sat by him on the box of his open carriage, a most tremendous buck he was, as he sat there serene, in state, driving his greys, and though nobody said a word on the subject of the marriage, everybody seemed to understand it. All she wanted was the proposal, and ah, how Rebecca now felt the want of a mother, a dear, tender mother who would have managed the business in ten minutes, and, in the course of a little delicate confidential conversation, would have extracted the interesting avowal from the bashful lips of the young man. Such was the state of affairs as the carriage crossed Westminster Bridge. The party was landed at the Royal Gardens in due time. As the majestic Joe stepped out of the creaking vehicle, the crowd gave a cheer for the fat gentleman, who blushed and looked very big and mighty, as he walked away with Rebecca under his arm. George, of course, took charge of Amelia. She looked as happy as a rose-tree in sunshine. "'I say, Dobbin,' says George, "'just look to the shawls and things. There's a good fellow.' And so, while he paired off with Miss Sedley, and Joe squeezed through the gate into the gardens with Rebecca at his side, honest Dobbin contented himself by giving an arm to the shawls, and by paying at the door for the whole party. He walked very modestly behind them. He was not willing to spoil sport. About Rebecca and Joe's he did not care a fig but he thought Amelia worthy even of the brilliant George Osborne, and as he saw that good-looking couple threading the walks to the girl's delight and wonder, he watched her artless happiness with a sort of fatherly pleasure. Perhaps he felt that he would have liked to have something on his own arm besides a shawl. The people laughed at seeing the gawky young officer carrying this female burthen. But William Dobbin was very little addicted to selfish calculation at all, and so long as his friend was enjoying himself— how should he be discontented? And the truth is, that of all the delights of the gardens, of the hundred thousand extra lamps, which were always lighted, the fiddlers and cocked hats who played ravishing melodies under the gilded cockle-shell in the midst of the gardens, the singers, both of comic and sentimental ballads, who charmed the ears there, the country dances, formed by bouncing cockneys and cockneyesses, and executed amidst jumping, thumping, and laughter— the signal which announced that Madame Saki was about to mount skyward on a slack rope ascending to the stars, the hermit that always sat in the illuminated hermitage, the dark walks, so favourable to the interviews of young lovers, the pots of stout handed about by the people in the shabby old liveries, and the twinkling boxes in which the happy feasters made believe to eat slices of almost invisible ham, of all these things, and of the gentle Simpson, that kind smiling idiot, who I dare say presided even then over the place, Captain William Dobbin did not take the slightest notice. He carried about Amelia's white cashmere shawl, and having attended under the gilt cockle-shell, while Mrs. Salmon performed the Battle of Borodino, a savage cantata against the Corsican upstart who had lately met with his Russian reverses, Mr. Dobbin tried to hum it as he walked away, and found he was humming the tune which Amelia Sedley sang on the stairs, as she came down to dinner. He burst out laughing at himself, for the truth is, he could sing no better than an owl. It is to be understood, as a matter of course, that our young people, being in parties of two and two, made the most solemn promises to keep together during the evening, and separated in ten minutes afterwards. Parties at Vauxhall always did separate, but twas only to meet again at supper-time, when they could talk of their mutual adventures in the interval. What were the adventures of Mr. Osborne and Miss Amelia? That is a secret. But be sure of this, they were perfectly happy and correct in their behavior, and as they had been in the habit of being together any time these fifteen years, their tete-a-tete -tete offered no particular novelty. 
But when Miss Rebecca Sharp and her stout companion lost themselves in a solitary walk, in which there were not above five score more of couples similarly straying, they both felt that the situation was extremely tender and critical, and now or never was the moment, Miss Sharp thought, to provoke that declaration which was trembling on the timid lips of Mr. Sedley. They had previously been to the panorama of Moscow, where a rude fellow, treading on Miss Sharp's foot, caused her to fall back with a little shriek into the arms of Mr. Sedley, and this little incident increased the tenderness and confidence of that gentleman to such a degree that he told her several of his favorite Indian stories over again, for at least the sixth time. "'How I should like to see India,' said Rebecca. "'Should you?' said Joseph, with a most killing tenderness, and was no doubt about to follow up this artful interrogatory by a question still more tender, for he puffed and panted a great deal, and Rebecca's hand which was placed near his heart could count the feverish pulsations of that organ, when, oh, provoking, the bell rang for the fireworks, and a great scuffling and running taking place, these interesting lovers were obliged to follow in the stream of people. Captain Dobbin had some thoughts of joining the party at supper, as, in truth, he found the Vauxhall amusements not particularly lively. But he paraded twice before the box where the now united couples were met, and nobody took any notice of him. Covers were laid for four. The mated parties were prattling away quite happily, and Dobbin knew he was as clean forgotten as if he had never existed in this world. "'I should only be de trop, said the captain, looking at them rather wistfully. "'I'd best go and talk to the hermit.' And so he strolled off out of the hum of men, and noise, and clatter of the banquet, into the dark walk, at the end of which lived that well-known pasteboard solitary. It wasn't very good fun for Dobbin, and, indeed, to be alone at Vauxhall, I have found, from my own experience, to be one of the most dismal sports ever entered into by a bachelor. The two couples were perfectly happy then in their box, where the most delightful and intimate conversation took place. Jos was in his glory, ordering about the waiters with great majesty. He made the salad, and uncorked the champagne, and carved the chickens, and ate and drank the greater part of the refreshments on the tables. Finally, he insisted upon having a bowl of rack punch. Everybody had rack punch at Vauxhall. Waiter, rack punch. That bowl of rack punch was the cause of all this history. And why not a bowl of rack punch as well as any other cause? Was not a bowl of prussic acid the cause of fair Rosamond's retiring from the world? Was not a bowl of wine the cause of the demise of Alexander the Great? Or at least, does not Dr. Lemprier say so? So did this bowl of rack punch influence the fates of all the principal characters in this novel without a hero, which we are now relating. It influenced their life, although most of them did not taste a drop of it. The young ladies did not drink it, Osborne did not like it, and the consequence was that Jos, that fat gourmand, drank up the whole contents of the bowl, and the consequence of his drinking up the whole contents of the bowl was a liveliness which at first was astonishing, and then became almost painful, for he talked and laughed so loud as to bring scores of listeners round the box, much to the confusion of the innocent party within it and, volunteering to sing a song, which he did in that maudlin high key peculiar to gentlemen in an inebriated state, he almost drew away the audience who were gathered round the musicians in the gilt scallop shell, and received from his hearers a great deal of applause. "'Bravo, Fadden!' said one. "'Encore, Daniel Lambert!' said another. "'What a figure for the tight-rope!' exclaimed another wag, to the inexpressible alarm of the ladies, and the great anger of Mr. Osborne. "'For heaven's sake, Jos, let us get up and go,' cried that gentleman, and the young woman rose. "'Stop, my dearest diddle-diddle darling!' shouted Jos, now as bold as a lion, and clasping Miss Rebecca round the waist. Rebecca started, but she could not get away her hand. The laughter outside redoubled. Jos continued to drink, to make love, and to sing, and, winking and waving his glass gracefully to his audience, challenged all or any to come in and take a share of his punch. Mr. Osborne was just on the point of knocking down a gentleman in top-boots who proposed to take advantage of this invitation, and a commotion seemed to be inevitable, 
when by the greatest good luck a gentleman of the name of Dobbin, who had been walking about the gardens, stepped up to the box. "'Be off, you fools!' said this gentleman, shouldering off a great number of the crowd, who vanished presently before his cocked hat and fierce appearance. And he entered the box in a most agitated state. "'Good heavens! Dobbin, where have you been?' Osborne said, seizing the white cashmere shawl from his friend's arm, and huddling up Amelia in it. "'Make yourself useful, and take charge of Jos here, whilst I take the ladies to the carriage.' Jos was for rising to interfere, but a single push from Osborne's finger sent him puffing back into his seat again, and the lieutenant was enabled to remove the ladies in safety. Jos kissed his hand to them as they retreated, and hiccuped out, "'Bless you! Bless you!' Then, seizing Captain Dobbin's hand, and weeping in the most pitiful way, he confided to that gentleman the secret of his loves. He adored that girl who had just gone out. He had broken her heart, he knew he had, by his conduct. He would marry her the next morning at St. George's, Hanover Square. He'd knock up the Archbishop of Canterbury at Lambeth, he would, by Jove, and have him in readiness, and, acting on this hint, Captain Dobbin shrewdly induced him to leave the gardens and hasten to Lambeth Palace, and, when once out of the gates, easily conveyed Mr. Joe Sedley into a hackney coach, which deposited him safely at his lodgings. George Osborne conducted the girls home in safety, and when the door was closed upon them, and as he walked across Russell Square, laughed so as to astonish the watchman. Amelia looked very ruefully at her friend as they went upstairs and kissed her, and went to bed without any more talking. "'He must propose to-morrow,' thought Rebecca. "'He called me his soul's darling four times. "'He squeezed my hand in Amelia's presence. "'He must propose to-morrow.' And so thought Amelia, too. And I dare say she thought of the dress she was to wear as bridesmaid, and of the presents which she should make to her nice little sister-in-law, and of a subsequent ceremony in which she herself might play a principal part, etc., and etc., and etc., and etc. Oh, ignorant young creatures! How little do you know the effect of rack punch! What is the rack in the punch at night to the rack in the head of a morning? To this truth I can vouch as a man. There is no headache in the world like that caused by Vauxhall Punch. Through the lapse of twenty years I can remember the consequence of two glasses, two wine-glasses, but two upon the honour of a gentleman, and Joseph Sedley, who had a liver complaint, had swallowed at least a quart of the abominable mixture. That next morning, which Rebecca thought was to dawn upon her fortune, found Sedley groaning in agonies which the pen refuses to describe. Soda-water was not invented yet. Small beer, will it be believed, was the only drink with which unhappy gentlemen soothed the fever of their previous night's potation. With this mild beverage before him, George Osborne found the ex-collector of Bogley Walla groaning on the sofa at his lodgings. Dobbin was already in the room, good-naturedly tending his patient of the night before. The two officers, looking at the prostrate bacchanalian, and askance at each other, exchanged the most frightful sympathetic grins. Even Sedley's valet, the most solemn and corrective gentleman, with the muteness and gravity of an undertaker, could hardly keep his countenance in order, as he looked at his unfortunate master. "'Mr. Sedley was uncommon wild last night, sir.' he whispered in confidence to Osborne, as the latter mounted the stair. "'He wanted to fight the acne coachman, sir. The captain was obliged to bring him upstairs in his arms like a baby.' A momentary smile flickered over Mr. Brush's features as he spoke. Instantly, however, they relapsed into their usual unfathomable calm, as he flung open the drawing-room door, and announced, "'Mr. Osborne?' "'How are you, Sedley?' that young wag began, after surveying his victim. "'No bones broke. There's a hackney coachman downstairs with a black eye and a tied-up head, vowing he'll have the law of you.' "'What do you mean, law?' Sedley faintly asked. "'For thrashing him last night, didn't he, Dobbin? You hit out, sir, like Molyneux. The watchman says he never saw a fellow go down so straight. Ask Dobbin.' "'You did have a round with the coachman,' Captain Dobbin said and showed plenty of fight, too. And that fellow with the white coat at Vauxhall, how Jos drove at him, how the women screamed! By Jove, sir, it did my heart good to see you. I thought you civilians had no pluck. 
but I'll never get in your way when you're in your cups, Jos. I believe I'm very terrible when I'm roused, ejaculated Jos from the sofa, and made a grimace so dreary and ludicrous that the captain's politeness could restrain him no longer, and he and Osborne fired off a ringing volley of laughter. Osborne pursued his advantage pitilessly. He thought Jos a milksop. He had been revolving in his mind the marriage question pending between Jos and Rebecca, and was not over well pleased that a member of the family into which he, George Osborne, of the blank, was going to marry, should make a mesalliance with a little nobody, a little upstart governess. "'You hit, you poor old fellow,' said Osborne, "'you terrible. Why, man, you couldn't stand. You made everybody laugh in the gardens, though you were crying yourself.' "'You were maudlin, Jos. Don't you remember singing a song?' "'A what?' Jos asked. "'A sentimental song, and calling Rosa, Rebecca, what's-her-name, Amelia's little friend, your dearest diddle-diddle darling?' And this ruthless young fellow, seizing hold of Dobbin's hand, acted over the scene, to the horror of the original performer, and in spite of Dobbin's good-natured entreaties to him to have mercy. "'Why should I spare him?' Osborne said to his friend's remonstrances when they quitted the invalid, leaving him under the hands of Dr. Gollop. "'What the deuce right has he to give himself his patronizing airs and make fools of us at Vauxhall? Who's this little schoolgirl that is ogling and making love to him? Hang it, the family's low enough already without her. A governess is all very well, but I'd rather have a lady for my sister-in-law. I'm a liberal man, but I've proper pride, and know my own station. Let her know hers.' and I'll take down that great hectoring nabob, and prevent him from being made a greater fool than he is. That's why I told him to look out, lest she brought an action against him. "'I suppose you know best,' Dobbin said, though rather dubiously. "'You always were a Tory, and your family's one of the oldest in England, but—' "'Come and see the girls, and make love to Miss Sharp yourself,' the lieutenant here interrupted his friend." But Captain Dobbin declined to join Osborne in his daily visit to the young ladies in Russell Square. As George walked down Southampton Row from Holborn, he laughed as he saw, at the Sedley Mansion, in two different stories, two heads on the lookout. The fact is, Miss Amelia, in the drawing-room balcony, was looking very eagerly towards the opposite side of the square, where Mr. Osborne dwelt, on the watch for the lieutenant himself. And Miss Sharp, from her little bedroom on the second floor, was in observation until Mr. Joseph's great form should heave into sight. "'Sister Anne is on the watch-tower,' said he to Amelia, "'but there's nobody coming.' And laughing and enjoying the joke hugely, he described in the most ludicrous terms to Miss Sedley the dismal condition of her brother. "'I think it's very cruel of you to laugh, George,' she said, looking particularly unhappy. But George only laughed the more at her piteous and discomfited mind, persisted in thinking the joke a most diverting one, and when Miss Sharp came downstairs, bantered her with a great deal of liveliness upon the effect of her charms on the fat civilian. "'Oh, Miss Sharp, if you could but see him this morning,' he said, moaning in his flowered dressing-gown, writhing on his sofa, "'if you could but have seen him lolling out his tongue to gull up the apothecary.' "'See whom?' said Miss Sharp. "'Whom? Oh, whom?' "'Captain Dobbin, of course, to whom we were all so attentive, by the way, last night.' "'We were very unkind to him,' Emmy said, blushing very much. "'I—I I quite forgot him.' "'Of course you did,' cried Osborne, still on a laugh. "'One can't be always thinking about Dobbin, you know, Amelia. Can one, Miss Sharp?' "'Except when he overset the glass of wine at dinner.' Miss Sharp said, with a haughty air and a toss of the head, I never gave the existence of Captain Dobbin one single moment's consideration. Very good, Miss Sharp. I'll tell him, Osborne said, and as he spoke, Miss Sharp began to have a feeling of distrust and hatred towards this young officer, which he was quite unconscious of having inspired. He is to make fun of me, is he? thought Rebecca. Has he been laughing about me to Joseph? Has he frightened him? Perhaps he won't come. A film passed over her eyes, and her heart beat quite quick. "'You're always joking,' said she, smiling as innocently as she could. "'Joke away, Mr. George. There's nobody to defend me.' And George Osborne, as she walked away, and Amelia looked reprovingly at him, 
felt some little manly compunction for having inflicted any unnecessary unkindness upon this helpless creature. "'My dearest Amelia,' said he, "'you are too good, too kind. You don't know the world. I do. And your little friend Miss Sharp must learn her station. Don't you think Jos will? Upon my word, my dear, I don't know. He may or may not. I'm not his master. I only know he is a very foolish, vain fellow, and put my dear little girl into a very painful and awkward position last night. My dearest diddle diddle darling. He was off laughing again, and he did it so drolly that Emmy laughed too. All that day Jos never came. But Amelia had no fear about this for the little schemer had actually sent away the page, Mr. Sambo's aide-de-camp, to Mr. Joseph's lodgings, to ask for some book he had promised, and how he was. And the reply through Joseph's man, Mr. Brush, was that his master was ill in bed, and had just had the doctor with him. He must come to-morrow, she thought, but she never had the courage to speak a word on the subject to Rebecca nor did that young woman herself allude to it in any way during the whole evening after the night at Vauxhall. The next day, however, as the two young ladies sat on the sofa, pretending to work, or to write letters, or to read novels, Sambo came into the room with his usual engaging grin, with a packet under his arm, and a note on a tray. "'Note for Mr. Jose, miss,' says Sambo. How Amelia trembled as she opened it. So it ran. "'Dear Amelia,' I send you the orphan of the forest. I was too ill to come yesterday. I leave town to-day for Cheltenham. Pray excuse me, if you can, to the amiable Miss Sharp for my conduct at Vauxhall, and entreat her to pardon and forget every word I may have uttered when excited by that fatal supper. As soon as I have recovered, for my health is very much shaken, I shall go to Scotland for some months, and am truly yours, Joe Sedley. It was the death warrant all was over. Amelia did not dare to look at Rebecca's pale face and burning eyes, but she dropped the letter into her friend's lap, and got up, and went upstairs to her room, and cried her little heart out. Blenkinsop, the housekeeper, there sought her presently with consolation, on whose shoulder Amelia wept confidentially, and relieved herself a good deal. "'Don't take on, miss. I didn't like to tell you. But none of us in the house have liked her except at first. I saw her with my own eyes reading your ma's letters. Pinner says she's always about your trinket-box and drawers, and everybody's drawers, and she's sure she's put your white ribbing into her box. I gave it her, I gave it her, Amelia said. But this did not alter Mrs. Blenkinsop's opinion of Miss Sharp. I don't trust them governesses, Pinner, she remarked to the maid. They give themselves the hairs and hopstarts of ladies, and their wages is no better than you nor me. It now became very clear to every soul in the house, except poor Amelia, that Rebecca should take her departure, and high and low, always with the one exception, agreed that that event should take place as speedily as possible. Our good child ransacked all her drawers, cupboards, reticules, and gimcrack boxes, passed in review all her gowns, fichus, tags, bobbins, laces, silk stockings, and falals, selecting this thing and that and the other to make a little heap for Rebecca, and going to her papa, that generous British merchant, who had promised to give her as many guineas as she was years old, she begged the old gentleman to give the money to dear Rebecca, who must want it, while she lacked for nothing. She even made George Osborne contribute, and nothing loath, for he was as free-handed a young fellow as any in the army. He went to Bond Street, and bought the best hat and spencer that money could buy. "'That's George's present to you, Rebecca dear,' said Amelia, quite proud of the bandbox conveying these gifts. "'What a taste he has! There's nobody like him!' "'Nobody,' Rebecca answered. "'How thankful I am to him!' She was thinking in her heart, "'It was George Osborne who prevented my marriage.' and she loved George Osborne accordingly. She made her preparations for departure with great equanimity, and accepted all the kind little Amelia's presents, after just the proper degree of hesitation and reluctance. She vowed eternal gratitude to Mrs. Sedley, of course, but did not intrude herself upon that good lady too much, who was embarrassed and evidently wishing to avoid her. 
she kissed Mr. Sedley's hand when he presented her with the purse, and asked permission to consider him for the future as her kind, kind friend and protector. Her behaviour was so affecting that he was going to write her a cheque for twenty pounds more, but he restrained his feelings. The carriage was in waiting to take him to dinner, so he tripped away with a— "'God bless you, my dear. Always come here when you come to town, you know. Drive to the mansion-house, James.' Finally came the parting with Miss Amelia, over which picture I intend to throw a veil. But after a scene in which one person was an earnest, and the other a perfect performer, after the tenderest caresses, the most pathetic tears, the smelling bottle, and some of the very best feelings of the heart had been called into requisition, Rebecca and Amelia parted, the former vowing to love her friend for ever and ever and ever. End of chapter 6